So maybe ambiente, the, the idea that, you know, we are responding to all of those, uh, you know, intangible conditions that we're confronted with in, in the places that we build. Jai Ramachandran and Sunita Kondo completed their undergraduate studies in Bangalore in 1994 and 1996 respectively. The Joy Sir then went on to get his Masters in Architecture and Urbanism from MIT Cambridge in 1998. Their talk today titled Design and Context is a brief look at their work which is based on their design approach and uh, which visually communicates context holds when it comes to design. So um, uh, this afternoon, I'll, I'll talk about context. Uh, and if one is to think about it, I mean, the, the Italian word is a lot nicer. Um, the, the word is ambiente. And that for me is a, a bit more holistic as an, as an in, you know, as a, uh, as a word to conjure up what it means, uh, you know, this word context, it's like the whole atmosphere of the place or so the atmosphere, the aura or the spirit, or you know the circumstances. It's everything put together that then impacts, uh, you know, our work as architects. So context somehow in English, uh, like we all know, native speakers of other languages, that English somehow just doesn't have the words to <laughs> to capture, you know, the the actual, um, you know, human condition. And so you know, Italian the Italian word is wonderful that way. Uh, and so maybe ambiente, the the idea that you know we are responding to all of those, uh, you know. Uh, um, intangible conditions that we're confronted with in, in the places that we build. Uh, <clears throat> I've divided this, this up into four. Um, they're kind of related to context in a way, uh, and they're deriving, you know, they're, they're contributing to the notion of context, or, or, or these are the words that sort of come to bear when we're thinking about context. So the first is that context has, is in, intrinsically related to the idea of meaning. Uh, there's this wonderful essay by Nelson Goodman called How Buildings Mean. And he says that, you know, there are these four ways in which buildings convey meaning. The first is the idea of denotation. So, you know, when we go to our old temples, he uses the Lincoln Memorial to illustrate these four kinds of meaning. And in the Lincoln Center, of course, you have the big, the big statue of Lincoln, uh, you know, much bigger than life size, a massive sort of uh, statue of Lincoln sitting there. Um, at the head of that axis, but then through these figural representations of the man himself, but also of his words and of other, uh, you know, aspirations that as a community, the Americans sort of want to, uh, you know, have the ambition to, to follow, that this then is one way that buildings mean, by literally transposing onto the surfaces of the building, these, this iconography, the sculpture, the painting, words, etc., that then convey meaning in very literal ways. We've got them in our temples, we do them sometimes in our buildings where we write things out onto the surface of the building to convey what the building is supposed to mean. Exemplification is the idea of, of making something special. Uh, and in this case, of course, it sits at the head of that big axis from the Capitol building on the right-hand side in that photograph on the top. And on the extreme left of that axis running east-west is the Lincoln Memorial. And, it, and so it, it, it's a really, really powerful uh, you know, location. Uh, but even in the architecture, as you can see in the middle image at the bottom, that it catches that axis through that indent in the facade, which is hollowed out where Lincoln's statue sits. And so the, the centrality of that building, its response to the symmetry of that organization is then captured through the organization of the architecture. And of course, it's augmented with that big water channel, et cetera, that runs it <laughs> under it. And so uh, everything about the building is, is exemplifying its particular particular location, its context, it, it responds to it in very dramatic ways. And we do that too in our buildings when we sort of have a flourish at a corner or we recognize the street front on one side that the building is in place uh, to respond to uh, conditions of the context. So exemplification is second. The third is the idea of metaphorical expression. And that's where we use certain uh, tropes from the past, if you will, that then make the building mean certain things. In the Lincoln Memorial, an, an example of that is that it's built in this kind of uh, Grecian style. It's got Greek uh, column uh, capital, it's like a temple almost as if the Parthenon was uh, transposed to or, or transferred to Washington, DC. But then it's making that connection back into history, saying that the spirit of where everything started, the idea of equality and fraternity, et cetera, 
And justice that it's all then transferred directly because the building is exactly like the old buildings. And so invoking that through that illusion back to the past. We do that too in our work. We look at Corbusier or Khan and we copy those uh, great heroes of ours and then think that that then validates our work. And so we're no different from those who do neoclassical work in the way that we look at the past to then validate our own work. And so the idea of metaphorical expression alluding to the past, but also metaphor. And, and we'll talk about that as we go further in, in, in the presentation about you know, how metaphor is used in architectural expression. And the last, which is actually the most interesting and which actually architects don't have any control over at all is the idea of mediated reference. And this is, for instance, the Lincoln Memorial was the site for the, you know, the big uh, million man march. Uh, for civil ci civil liberties in America, for equality and equal rights, etc., and you know Martin Luther King favor famously gave giving his speech at the head of that march, and so through that association with the Black movement, uh, that it it became then symbolic of this. Of course, Lincoln himself, the great, uh, you know, the, the 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 person who kind of uh, you know emancipated the Black uh, population, at least tried to. Uh, that that it was always already pregnant with all of those historical references, but through this march and through you know Martin Luther King Jr.'s great speech, etc., the building then is sort of evoking that uh, association and becomes meaningful in that way. And so all of our buildings too, you know, particularly public buildings, they have all of these relationships to certain events, to certain people, for better or for worse. It's sometimes even beyond your control that buildings then come to mean you know things that we don't really want them to mean so <clears throat> there are these associations that we don't have control over so they're all in some way related to context not to the physical context but sometimes to social conditions uh you know to to illusions from the past etc that all of that uh is is this idea of ambiente that it all comes into play as we think of our buildings <clears throat> And so when we think of things like that about meaning, when we look at buildings today, the building on the right is ITPL in Bangalore, which is the International Tech Park in 2000, Singapore, and the Karnataka government got into an agreement and made what was the first large IT park in Bangalore. And of course, we've seen many more of those in the city now. Uh, the building is a, is a sustainable building in today's parlance. So it saves a lot of electricity. It's got very clever air conditioning. Uh, it uses, uh, you know, special glass so that the heat gain within the buildings is controlled. All of them valid and important conditions in our, in our, uh, you know, uh, cities today. But the buildings do not evoke the kind of quality that these old buildings, you know, have. That somehow, when you go to Melkote, for instance, or any roadside, you know, historic building, that they somehow seem to capture some condition of our existence, which is way beyond what these modern buildings uh, are able to capture. And the reason for that, and we'll come to it a little later, is because we seem to be stuck in this conversation about technique, about merely uh, figuring out ways in which to put things together. And we're not thinking about metaphor or of meaning, or we don't even discuss this work in that way at all. Uh, even when we are idea, you know, ideating about them or discussing it with our clients, our ambitions are pretty base. You know, we're thinking about the climate, which of course is important, but we just seem, can't seem to go beyond that conversation about uh, you know the pragmatic uh, conditions that uh, we've we've been uh, we're trying to address. So, how do we come back to this conversation about meaning and memory and metaphor that then uh, seem to be uh, you know everywhere in our in our historical buildings? <clears throat> meaning is also something that's tied closely to the materials that we use. That somehow in school, you know, at least when I was in school, we were taught that. Uh, stone was supposed to be used a certain way, that concrete was supposed to be used a certain way, that there were these rules by which one operated. And uh, that is that is a way to think of it if you was if you were only thinking about it in terms of technique and in terms of you know the structure of things. Whereas when you look through history, you see that the same stone, for instance, in the Pithi Palace on the left, the stone is used as if to convey very clearly that there is a distinction between the paradise that's within that walls and the and, and the profane world that is outside that you're not allowed in that there is this strong uh, you know border that you can't cross because of the heft of that rustication etc it's travertine brought as if the hill itself was brought in and, and moved to Florence to make this wall and when Khan uses the same stone to clad his uh, his museum in Texas of course it would be very expensive to move large blocks of stone like that onto the site which is the pragmatic consideration, but then Khan cuts the stone into these slivers 
exposing the sort of rather porous and and uh, and fragile interior life of the stone making the building immediately more ethereal more accessible almost translucent uh, that the inner public life of that building was part of the public life outside that there was this kind of screen that uh, separated you and not this robust uh, you know separation uh, of course, in Itmat Dwala's uh, tomb, in, in it's not travertine, it's marble, but they, you know, from Khan, this is an even step, it's a step even further, making a building that almost seems as if draped on, draped with muslin, that, uh, you know, the winds from the Yamuna are coming in and cooling the inner uh, chambers where Itmat Dwala is waiting for the angels to come take him to heaven, that this is the most beautiful, most comfortable place to rest, because it's like a tent with all the, all the winds flowing through it. And so, the question one is asking in all of these three projects is that what is it that I want to convey or what is it that the building wants to uh, wants to stand for in terms of the way the materials are used to convey meaning that this is a place, a way station for Dwala, or it's a public building that needs access or it's a private domain that has these sort of restrictions that all of these stone applications mean different things and so we have to ask that question uh, you know, what does a brick want to be or what does is, what is a stone want to be? And, and those answers are embedded in the nature of, of what we are doing. Um, <clears throat> this idea of meaning also is related to context in, in other ways, like for instance, in, in the Taj Mahal or in any of these, even in Itmatu Dwala's tomb, that everything there, the articulation, the, 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 the delicate, uh, you know, illustrations, etc., they all hark back to the idea of the Garden of Paradise. And so embedded in all of the all of the iconography in those buildings, it's tied back to, uh, to the notion of the Garden of Paradise, which, which is what these buildings are trying to invoke, so that till, till the soul is, is, isn't re released up to heaven and, and you know, is in those resplendent gardens, that at least there is an approximation of it here on Earth where, where they would be uh, quite comfortable. Uh, and so there's this connection between the iconography of these buildings, the way those plans are laid out, and this notion of what a garden of paradise may look like. Uh, the second is the idea of, of the cost of things, and, and this isn't something new to our culture. It's been always the case that somehow the cost of things then ascribes certain value to it that lifts it up from the mundane. So, for instance, aquamarine, the, the color, that the, the pigment that's used to make the blue, used to be the most expensive pigment you, you could have to make colors out of. And, and so if someone commissioned a piece of art and there was a lot of blue in it, it meant that it was very, very expensive, the piece of art. And then it got linked to all of these holy figures and they were always draped in blue or, or the big patron was always draped in blue, signifying the relationship between the cost of the thing and divinity. And the third, uh, most abstract and most difficult to conjure up is the idea of deep structure that, that Korea talks about, that there are some places, actually many, in fact, in India or even abroad, that you go there and somehow you feel connected to it and, and it's it's across every everybody who goes there you know so this is Boginandishwara temple in in Nandi hills close to Bangalore and everybody we've taken there I mean it's a place that you just feel like you have to sit for some more time you 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 are you you find that there's something familiar about the place that maybe it's a deep-seated memory that all of us share of digging down for water or piling up rocks to, to touch the sky, that somehow there's some ancient memory that's triggered from places like this that then uh, bring back, uh, you know, a shared consciousness. So, I mean, architecture has to aspire to these things because we used to once talk about architecture like that and we don't anymore. And, and in fact, it's quite strange when someone starts talking about design in those sort of very arcane and, and, and abstract ways. But unfortunately, you know, that's robbed us of buildings of real sub substance and we don't see things like that anymore. Uh, and so the connection of location and meaning, uh, context and meaning is also in art, you know, so in, in the church, for instance, where you've got the stations of the cross on the walls and, and you know, the, the priest is reading about Christ's life through the Bible, that there is a distinct connection between the art itself, the message the art is trying to convey and the context in which it is found. And this is true in our temples as well, that all of the mythologies and stories that, you know, are precious to us find their expression in our temple, on our temple walls, in all of the, all of the paintings, etc. That there, there are these stories and tales that then are relayed through the art. And so the context of where the art is and, and the meanings and messages of this art are interlinked in very, very close and intimate ways. 
and when the medici took the art out of the church and brought it back to the palaces that somehow that umbilical cord was cut the art now became sort of decoration and and when you think of art now you think of it in terms of the brush stroke or the way the light is handled or the cost of it you know how much did it cost who had it before us and in fact the very depiction of meaning through the art itself is not not so much discussed like what is the story in the art you're thinking about technique mostly of course we've gone way past that point because art now is everywhere on our pencil cases on our sun class cases on a laptop bags etc that somehow in in tran in transferring the art out of its location and then being able to multiply them infinitely what happens to the original piece of art its meaning its value etc and there's a great piece by Walter Benjamin about that that I, I hope you you guys will follow up on it talks about the value of the art when when you know in the age of reproduction digital or, or mechanical reproduction where you can just make as many copies of it as as possible what does it mean to the original piece of art, its meaning, and its location, et cetera, and to context? Of course, architecture as well has had that quality of, of, of being transferred infinitely. And so when Vijay Malia makes his building in Bangalore and announces his arrival as the emperor of Bangalore, what does he do? He says, let's build our own Empire State Building to express that condition of, of control and hegemony over the city. Uh, it's a really tacky and misproportioned version of the Empire State Building, but nonetheless, it is a statement of that connection back to you know what what is a symbolic expression of, of the empire state so um also in architecture the idea that somehow uh, you know in in art for instance in leonardo da vinci's great painting the virgin on the rocks he invokes the heavens with the with the arch top of that painting in architecture we see that a lot in mughal and christian architecture where domes and vaults and arches are all in a way used to signify the heavens. So in, in tombs, for instance, you always have a dome over the tomb and the dome is supposed to be uh, an invocation of, of the sky. And so for me, when, when Khan makes that wonderful barrel vault in the Kimball Art Museum, he's bringing back from the Medici's art back into spiritual space, that he's giving art back its context, you know, with that spiritual light coming up from that uh, gap between the two cantilevered beams, et cetera, that this then is now once again a, an appropriate place to see the art and, and to appreciate its, uh, its meaning. Um, um, this is, uh, you know, th there are three projects here that I'm, I've done, but then I'm also taking the big risk of showing you some of the master's works and, and you will see that, you know, that there is a long way to go, but then there are lessons for so many of us, uh, you know, in the way that the masters are thinking about, uh, you know, their projects. This is Utsun in, in, the, in Sydney. Uh, and if you look at the Sydney Harbour on the left, is, it's, it's an incredible, one of the greatest harbours in the world, but it's got all of these fingers, they're called headlands in, in Australia. And these big headlands, they come out into the harbour. And so each of those little coves become safe, uh, you know, places to then dock your ships, et cetera. And on one such headland is where the Sydney Opera House uh, competition site was located. So that's right there, up close to the bridge uh, on the left-hand side. And when, Sid when Utsun was working on this project, he was thinking, of course, of his own homeland of the of the Danish uh, of the uh, Danish castle, uh, you know, where Hamlet apparently uh, used to live. So this is the Hamburg castle. But he was thinking about how architecture could become an expression of that particular geological condition. And there's this wonderful sketch by Peter Stasbury of the Avalon headland. And for me, and of course, a lot of people have written about it as well, but really the, the opera house is an expression of that kind of a landform, which you climb up onto the end of that landform and then survey the horizon survey, just like Hudson was talking about those plateaus. I mean, the, the platforms in South America, that these, these are incredibly empowering locations for public life, that if you were to climb up onto a platform and look out onto the horizon, that that was an empowering uh, condition and so that base which is really the headland itself expressed in architectural ways coming up to that top from where then you survey the world uh, and so here's here's the access up so you're walking up the headlands created now as architecture and then out onto that amazing room at the end of it resplendent with all of the light looking out onto the horizon so you're the king of the world or the queen of the world up there uh, just like you are in nature up on that headland once you've climbed up on, on top of it. 
Um, in, in terms of light, uh, uh, you know, the idea is also, you know, like Richard Laplace here, the great Australian architect, when he rode across uh, India in, in the 1960s, he passed by Elora and made this amazing sketch. And he says that by drawing the sketch, the section and the plan of Elora, somehow he understood what the building was about or what this construct was about. And he said, you know, the idea is very simple that the young initiates, the monks who come into the, into the order, they come into the building at the bottom, they are coming through these constricted gates. They don't really have a view out. The Buddha is deep set in that section, so there's not much light in there. And, and it's really dark and sort of dingy down at the bottom there. And so the young initiates don't have much of a perspective and they can't really see the truth. And as they come up that section to the topmost floor, suddenly now there's a lot more light on the Buddha who's at the end of that thing. And, and the gates have fallen away because now you're up above the gates, you have perspective out onto the horizon. And that's an invocation that as you grow up in the order that you have better perspective and you have more light on the truth. And so that's a beautiful, simple way in which to read that. But for me, you know, when I was when I was at the Sikand, at the tomb of Sikandra, I'll, I'll, or tomb of Akbar at Sikandra, I'll show you pictures of it later. But there is an there is a an inverse relationship sometimes also to the idea of light. That somehow in our culture we always think of light as being the the truth. That somehow you need brightness to, to see the truth. And in fact, in in Sikandra, the reverse is true. That somehow in making your passage down to the to the you know to the hall where Akbar's tomb is. This hall has almost no light. It's completely dark. Uh, that somehow in the absence of light that you are then in communion with something far greater than the physical sensations that you may get. That somehow you, you cross over into a metaphysical plane when you, when you have the loss of your physical senses. Uh, and it is a profound experience to make your way down into that chamber and, and be in communion with the great man in a hall where you can't even see anything. I mean, that's quite something. And so both these are conditions one aspires to, the notion of, of, of light as, as a signifier for meaning, but also that darkness is important, that somehow in those dark spaces that there may be other ways in which you appreciate uh, what is true and what is, uh, what is uh, valuable. Uh, and so for the first project, this is a, a, a school we uh, completed just uh, you know, a couple of years ago, just before the lockdowns. And so they used it for a few months. They're back to using it again. Uh, and this is uh, like everybody who does a school. We, of course, thought about the man under the tree, as Khan told us to think about, but also our own histories, you know, our ancient histories. Here's Akbar and Tansen meeting Swami Haridas under that amazing tree um, in a benign environment, exchanging realizations. Um, and so this invocation of a very, very comfortable place in which you had all kinds of scales for people to meet either as a, as a couple or in large gatherings, that they were all valuable. And, and so these interstitial spaces between rooms became the most important condition. So the site sits at the, at the bottom of, of nice, river, uh, nice Road. Nice Road is a highway that runs uh, along the periphery of the city. And so it's out in the middle of nowhere. There's, there's farmlands and fields around. It's very, very good earth, et cetera. Um, and it's got a very large site, which, which we're now developing into, uh, into play fields, et cetera. Um, and so when we got it, you know, this is a this is a, a, a short passage I wrote for Nisha Matthew, who was curating an exhibition in London. I'm just going to take uh, the liberty of reading it. It says, air thick with sharp light and cloaked in deep shadow, air pulsating with voices and pregnant in silence, air hot and damp, cool and light, filled with the perfume of freshly tilled earth. This air now ours filling our senses and calling out to us to remember again our childhood. Carved out of this block of concrete and compressed earth, a space of prospect and refuge, of pause and passage, of chance encounters, and that ideal of Khan's institutions, a place for the exchange of realizations. This street made of earth and filled with air, robust and yet fluid, ordered and yet diffused for one child in the community, this street is the heart of Ira. So th this is all of the stuff that's in between, between you know the classrooms, a space that's really of value. And so the first sketch as well shows that really what is in between is what we're interested in, in terms of its inflection, its changes in scale and its quality of light. Uh, some sketches from those early explorations. And you can see that the plans are very, very simply organized. They're on an eight meter grid. So all of the rooms are organized, but they're shifting back and forth. A lesson we learned from Herman Hertzberger who has done a whole bunch of schools and by shifting the, the rooms back and forth, you find spaces in between that then 
uh, could have, uh, you know, could hold uh, students. But we were also interested in the idea of separating the, the profane world of the, of the outside of where the parents are, etc. And so we created this shaft through the building, which was all landscape separating out the profane world from the sacred world of the school. And of course, now that garden's become a profuse tropical jungle, and it really makes quite a statement in a very ordered building that then makes that separation evident. And so here are the rest of the plans. And, and you can see the atrium inside that building, which is you know constantly shifting and, and with a lot of space that then the kids use in multiple ways for, for meeting, for art, for book readings. Uh, and for games, for running around, et cetera, that there's a lot of life outside of the rigor of the classrooms. And so here are some sections through that building. So this is uh, the entrance section where you've got a double height entrance and, and classrooms, et cetera, at the back. This is a section through that garden with the pergolas on top that then separate out the, the entryway from the rest of the school. And a section here which shows you the double height, the triple height volume inside the, the uh, atrium which has got a skylight above it. And so the skylight is heating up all that air at the top and the air gets out through large openings on the upper floor, creating a constant draft of air that runs through that atrium all through the year. Um, uh, so there's the school, a very simple, uh, you know, the organization of the school is completely evident uh, in the way that it's organized. Uh, the main architect on this was from JJ, uh, a boy called Orko Banerjee. And really all credit to him. He managed, he magically appeared in the office on the day that we got the commission and left after he handed over the project. It was as if God sent, you know, that he just arrived uh, when, we were, when we were to do this. Uh, he had an amazing relationship with our uh, structural engineer, the famous Krishna Hegde, who used to work with Mahinder Raj. And the both of them really, uh, you know, are the ones responsible for, for what this building has turned out to be. It's quite a, quite a lovely environment within uh, the building, if I say this to myself. Um, so here's here's the entrance way with the garden on the left hand side, which which has become quite thickly, uh, you know, vegetated, uh, separating out, uh, you know, the school from from the entryway. Um, we had a muralist from Pune who did this lovely mural on the soffit, lying down like Michelangelo, making these drawings on the soffit of that uh, of that concrete slab. And there's a view from the, the play fields looking back at the building with that swath of landscape that runs cutting through that building. Um, some more images, uh, the drums are all staircases. Uh, and of course, the play fields are all on the right hand side. And so you've got all kinds of galleries from which to watch your teams uh, play sport, etc. And so this is really infecting out to the, the play fields in the north. Uh, this is an older picture, but you, you see the order of the building and, and the cadence of the windows. And, and, uh, and this was all Orko's, uh, Orko's doing. I mean, he really uh, mentored a lot of young uh, kids at the office as well, interns, et cetera, to, to get all of this done. Uh, so you enter through this uh, double height uh, volume. Uh, you're in that space where the landscape splits uh, the building. And then you come into uh, this uh, resplendent, uh, you know, internal volume, which is skylit and, and uh, some classrooms uh, within. Uh, these are all Montessori style classrooms. So they've got a lot of place for activities and classrooms above. But really for me, the heart of the building is this internal section, the section that then has all of these bridges and connections and things like that. And, that then make, make it a really active environment to inhabit. Um, these are drawings by Surabhi Banerjee, another uh, architect from Bombay, from Kamla Reheja, uh, made these beautiful drawings. And then, um, so we made these, I made these drawings during the lockdown. Uh, this was my lockdown activity. Uh, building was already over, so they're based on photographs. They aren't uh, constructed uh, perspectives. But we always imagine that at some point the kids would come back and, and you know, these places would be filled with life again. And that's true now. Uh, so now it's back to bustling with, uh, you know, with kids, etc. But these are, this is kind of the quality of that internal world, world you know, um, with light and with volume and, and then the structure that then organizes it, it all. So there's, there's an image of the amphitheater, um, the structure of that uh, internal volume with all kinds of degrees of light coming through, um, triple height, double height with, with bridges and, and overlooks, et cetera. Um, and, and deep shadows as well, so that it isn't only about light, but it, 
it's also about these dark uh, darker places where then you really appreciate uh, you know the transitions between these uh, and of course you have vantage from multiple places so you're always partaking of that section as you work your way up that building and out onto terraces on the uppermost floor the second uh, uh, condition of, of uh, you know the context is also that you know we we are not our architecture doesn't have a, a, a kind of benign or, or secondary role to play in the context. And this wonderful essay by Martin Heidegger uh, called The Origin of the Work of Art, he talks about architecture in a way uh, as giving presence to what is latent in the context. So he talks, talks about it saying, uh, standing there, the building holds its ground against the sky. Uh, I'm sorry, one second, hold on. Standing there, the, uh, the building holds its ground against the storm raging above it, and so first makes the storm manifest in its violence. The luster and gleam of stone through, though itself apparently glowing only by the grace of the sun, yet first brings to light the light of day, the breadth of the sky, the darkness of the night. So he talks about architecture in a way that is giving presence to what is existing, that through its, uh, through its static condition, through the, the luster of its materials, that it gives presence to all that is latent. And this, I take it to mean that it isn't also only the, the physical conditions that are present there, but architecture also sometimes give, gives expression to latent social or political or you know, those sorts of conditions that somehow that they make manifest certain conditions that otherwise are hidden from view. Uh, and that's a wonderful way to think of your buildings, that the buildings aren't benign, aren't uh, sort of only reacting but they are also proactive and they're also creating conditions that then give expression to things that may be uh, hidden from view. Um, uh, in terms of context, there are also these two other conditions of context. The notion on the left-hand side, these are paintings by Sudhir Patwardhan, a Mumbai-based artist, and, and he paints the Irani Cafe owner in white, just like the marble tops, as if the, the Irani cafe owner through his years in the Irani cafe has become like part of the furniture that he's hewn out of the same piece of marble, etc. But it is also the, a, a reflection on that particular time because it was painted just after the emergency. And so in the mirrors of, of the Irani cafe are all the bustling crowds of the city that are now missing in his cafe. And he sits there wistfully thinking of a better day when you know his cafe was packed with people with the noise and laughter of his clients. Um, and, and in fact, it's quite a, an in, incredible piece because it reminds us of our own uh, predicament these past two years, you know, where we haven't been able to step out and the Irani cafe waits for us. Um, and the city, on the other hand, in terms of context is also all of us, you know, the, the person in the bus looking back at us, the man in the white shirt, the person sipping tea, those two people on the mezzanine that each of us bring to the context our own point of view. And so for Patwardhan, the city is made of all of these vectors, all of these trajectories that each of us have our own interpretations, our own prejudices, our baggage. And really the work of architecture is a work, is a way of finding ourselves and our own uh, you know, place in the world. And so that I think that's wonderful that on the one hand, context is what one reacts to. And on the other is, it is what we bring to uh, the conversation. Uh, and so there are these two paintings by uh, Magritte, uh, the pipe. This is not a pipe in French at the bottom. So which one is true, the image of the pipe or the word pipe? And neither of them is true because he calls the painting the treasury of images. And really to be a real pipe, you need to be able to hold it. You need to be able to inhale the smoke, et cetera. And so there is that embodied engagement with reality that is required for you to understand uh, the value of it. And in architecture more so than anything because we are so caught up with the image of architecture on our phones on our laptops in the magazines that we forget that in fact the real experience of architecture to be in a place and to embody that experience is what really matters to give us the real sense of what the place is um, and the second is just like patwardhan's painting that each of us bring to bear in reading uh, you know our context like this painting which is called the key of dreams that really we are the key of dreams that we look at that horse and we remember and it triggers a memory that then is just ours and we're bringing to bear that memory in the recognition of the of the place and of the context um, 
And so this is Caesar at the age of 34 working in, in Portugal. Uh, this is our, you know, the context. So if, if I just show you what Caesar did, look at these two buildings sitting on that same context. The church flattens out the land negating the context it turns its face away from the ocean and it has no windows at all as if to say that the real truth and the real beauty lie within the walls of the church and that you have to enter the church partake of the sermon and the service and then you know you will you will be in touch with divinity or with beauty whereas in in the secular building that caesar does he orients his building to the oceans uh, looking in the other direction and also uses the topography to create a building that sits in that land in a very particular way. And both these buildings are valid in their own way because their underlying belief systems are expressed in the way the buildings then are built. And so we need to ask our quest ourselves that question when we start the work. What is this building about? And so those two beautiful rooms that Caesar designs, the tea, tea rooms, and, and it's basically just large rooms with almost, and, and the roof seems to be just floating over the, over the mullions of the windows, a cleverly disguised structural system that then allows you to imagine that it is just a roof that then you sit under to partake of the ocean. This is Glen Market in, in Australia, but this beautiful building that sits at the head of the Shoalhaven River running east. Uh, and what is amazing about it is that this building captures immediately that particular location and its and its great vantage out onto the east and so this is that beautiful building the Boyd center that has a large hall and and staying accommodation for 32 students uh, we did the market master class i did the market master class in 2012 in that room staying in that building and it is the most amazing location i mean just in terms of citing the building in the right place and then partaking of that incredible context in absolutely the most uh, subtle and, and meaningful way. And so that room from where you look out onto the, onto the river, uh, you know, when we went there, Richard Laplastia talked about this room and the sighting of this room and the way that the land between, as you can see from the earlier images, the building is, is quite far away from the river, but in the way that he's handled, Mercat has handled the fall of the land towards the river, that it brings the river into the room that by, by collapsing that foreground, that now the building is all about the river. It's all about being on the threshold of that river. Uh, one of the most beautiful rooms, uh, you know, that I have ever been in. Um, and then of course, context also giving presence to the context. This is Khan in Dhaka. Um, and I remember Bijoy Jain's wonderful lecture in Italy a few years ago on Khan. And he spoke about this building as if some sort of a geological result of, of the bay, of the floodplain, that in, in the way that the Ganges flowed from the Indian Peninsula out into the Bay of Bengal, that as the floods receded, the building was revealed. It was carved out of, of the water, this block of stone. And those striations that Khan used to mark the, the concrete lifts and, and those striations transferring in all directions as if latitude and longitude, that somehow the water in revealing the building marked the building as the floodplains uh, you know, uh, decreased or descended. Um, most profound way to think of this building as an expression of being on that floodplain at that particular point in the passage of the river. Um, uh, this is a building that we did again. This is our first architectural building and we had a wonderful architect in the office from J.J. Nayantara Karnik, who was our first employee uh, and helped us in designing this building in Trichy using the local material and of course giving presence to the amazing clay that was available all along the Kaveri belt there. Uh, and so using the, the, the help of two incredible engineers, Mani Maran and Rajendran, that we were able to make this building at 500 rupees a square foot because of that recognition of what is available readily at that site and making a building as an expression of that material and those construction techniques. Um, um, another building which is all about its particular location. This is a building in a, in a stone processing factory. These guys process granite for the world. They're the largest processors of granite in the country now. And they have such sophisticated machines that we, we just basically asked them just for fun whether they would be able to do a screen out of stone. Um, and, and, you know, they took it on as a challenge. And we'd never probably be able to do this again, but those screen slivers are actually three pieces of granite, uh, very, very heavy granite on a very light metal screen 
And so the south face of the building is now clad with this amazing stone screen that then protects the building, but, but is made out of a material that is coming from this particular location, from this particular opportunity that we had. Um, and this is Carpa in Venice, a building that is all about the precariousness of being in Venice and the fear of aqua alta, the high tide coming into the building. So you, it's the lowest floor, it's the Quirini Stampalia Museum. And you come into that building and everything about the way the interior has been handled is, is a, an accommodation of water. And so you come into it and you're walking through these bridges which have got these high skirtings and the water can flood into all of these troughs and, and channels as the waters rise and, and fall away. Uh, so every time you come in here, depending on, on the high tide, you have a different expression of that building. Uh, in how the water is accommodated within it, really giving presence to the condition, to that precarious condition on the edge of the water. And in the main hall as well, the 100 year flood line is marked on the side walls of that building so that the base material, cheap aggregate material turns up the corner and marks that uh, horizontal datum uh, above which are all of the of fancy materials, glass and travertine and brass, et cetera. Uh, and so really marking that condition of flooding and and uh, and so there's the 100 year flood line and that datum that then marks uh, that point in the building uh, and we're really keen on scarpa because of this idea of juxtapositions that he's he all well, so much of his architecture is about the conversation between oppositions the conversation between lightness and weight the conversation between uh, you know roughness and and uh, you know, uh, smooth textures, the conversation between light and dark, etc. that these oppositions become, and, and really the celebration of how those two things come together. So the joint becomes, uh, you know, the crucial articulation for Scarpa always. Uh, and so when we were doing this, we were, uh, you know, working on a, a factory, a, a retail building on a factory site in Bangalore, we were thinking of Scarpa and we were thinking also of the history of this site. Uh, which is a, a site that had always been used for factory line production so linear buildings you can see traces of this on the right hand side of the site the site is right in the middle of the of the plan but on the right you can see traces of an old factory building on the left you can see some more sh factory sheds but most of them have now disappeared and they're all either large shopping malls or residential buildings or you know office buildings etc and these are only a few sites that are still left over that still carry the remnant of these old uh, factory uh, sheds and so we were wondering how we would express this history in the building that we would do there the other condition that we were responding to is that the site is also on a on a 30 year lease and so after 30 years this the land is going to be given back to the landlord and so we wanted to make something that could be dismantled and taken away and so we thought to of steel as as the material that we would use so that it was you know infinitely uh, re, you know, re recycled Recycle. or taken away and, and put into other locations, etc. So simple steel structure that then invoked both the history of the site and those steel sheds that used to exist here and an expression of the time of, of the temporality of holding uh, this site. And so here are some sketches of that. It's been rotated uh, 90 degrees counterclockwise. So the road is now on the right hand side. You're entering through that neck with the secret garden at the back, which is, you know, this is around a two acre site. Um, so there's that secret garden with these uh, with these buildings and some sketches, etc. And so there's the plan of the building, but the plan is organized very simply in 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 this uh, in these ways. So you've got a, a a very very simple steel structure. These masonry elements, which are in bold red color, which then are are uh, you know the oppositions or the expressions of of uh, contrast and the three three trees that we kept on site, which you know mark. Uh, the cadence of that structure. So this is really the diagram of that plan. And we also worked with a wonderful engineer here in Bangalore, a guy called uh, Manjunath, who's, who's kind of a genius, uh, you know, a structural engineer. And he created this amazingly light, uh, you know, language for the steel, um, you know, all of the steel structure working with Divyang and Anna Rose, uh, another JJ uh, alumni was a project architect on this building. And, and the contributions of all three of them, Divyang, Anna, and uh, Manjunath, are why the building is what it is. I mean, it's a real, real expression of that collaboration between the three people. Um, this is Divyang's drawing of the interior of that place, some sketches of the, of the staircase. 
and we struggled a lot with the facade. I mean, with how this this sort of factory shed would come out onto the street, um, and so um, these here are some pictures of that building uh, with with the uh, gable end of the factory wall, which Final building and and uh, oh, the, are you able to hear me? The internet seems to be dropping off. Sorry, hold on. Are you able to hear me, Anaya? Yes, sir. It was just for two minutes in the. Uh... Previously, it was stuck, but now to another we're... network. Yeah. yeah, is that is that better? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. So here's another photograph. So we've left the wall exactly as it is. We're we're hoping to put a sealant on it, but it's it's. I mean, we haven't painted it or cleaned it or anything. And so in that in that contrast, we find that our building then you know the likeness of it becomes even more uh, you know uh, evident. Uh, and so here's the dialogue between the, the brick elements, which house the kitchen on the left and the restrooms on the right and the delicate metal structure that then slips past them. Um, and we were really keen on these tolerances, the space between things uh, and how the light would come through them and how much would you have them? Is it 200 mil? Is it 500 mil? You know, these questions of how close do we get so that we get, uh, you know, uh, the, the intended effect. And so just about touching, but not touching, you know, that sort of real delicate uh, game. Uh, some more images, the trees that exist, this kind of garden with a water body, uh, and you always see them through the frame of, of these metal uh, elements. Uh, there's a stair tower with, uh, with, with a lantern at the end, which is kind of at the end of that secret garden, um, uh, and some more images of the building itself. And the interiors were done by Tanushri. Uh, Tanushri runs a company called YM, so she co collaborated with us to do the interiors of the building. Um, and uh, and this, I'm just going to run through this. This is Nalanda University. I think we're running out of time. We've got another 10 minutes, I think. So i rush through. Uh, this is uh, with Allies and Morrison, but an expression of that particular location, the brick bringing that brick into bear, but also thinking of it as, as a mixed use uh, university. We lost the competition to Doshi's, to Rajiv and, and Doshi's office. Um, and, um, and, and it is under construction now, but yeah, this was something that, you know, we were really keen on with uh, Eliza Morrison. And the third thing is seniors about many people coming together. Architecture requires collaboration, but it is also, it also requires the conspiracy of circumstances and participants as, uh, as David Chipperfield says, that it isn't the work of a solitary genius that many people have to come together to make something meaningful. And so that wonderful image on the left of Cyrus Kabir, who's the, the Nairobi-based artist, who makes these glasses that each of us have to learn to see differently the world around us in, through the eyes of our clients, our consultants, our colleagues in the office, that really the rich work comes as a result of the assimilation of these different points of view. And we learned that early on through our, uh, our work in, in school. So we won the NASA trophy in 1994. There's Suni and me right in the middle of that picture. Suni standing in front of me. And on the right, our office, uh, you know, team at the office that really we, we would like to believe that it is a collaboration that a lot of us coming together to work to make something and that it isn't really me or Suni sort of making the, the sublime move and then just getting it drafted out that it is a conversation with many people. And so 100 hands, you know, all of us together. Uh, and so this project is the BIC, the Bangalore International Center. And here there are two particular conditions we were interested in with regards to the context of the, of the project. The first was we were really concerned about how you design in, in, in by committee, that many people are involved in this project. And so how do we get all of that information from a disparate group of uh, people and also how we convey our ideas back to this group. And the second question was the idea of publicness and how, how a building can express its public nature. The third idea of the Society of the room, of Rooms is really something that is particular to the BIC, that it's a mixed use building. And so we are also, also keen to make a plan that then is like a society, a community of things, you know, so that the in-between space like the school is rich and varied and allows uh, for communion. Uh, this is Khan doing the mother house, the Dominican mother house. And this is just an illustration of the idea of, of design by committee, 
resulting in something that is profound and meaningful. So Khan starts with kind of a, a very loose diagram on the left hand side, but, but ends up after two years of work on this through negotiations with the client on budget, on the meaning of the convent itself. He comes to a plan that captures for me succinctly what the Dominican order is about. That this is a building where there is no separation between the spiritual, the private and the public. That there is this kind of conversation that the sisters are constantly engaged with community and that there is no separation between where they live and where they work with, with the community. That the, the plan, the gestalt of the plan expresses that. So here are some images of Khan's sketches. And the second question about publicness, this is Moneo's building in, in Murcia, in Spain. Uh, it's in a context where there is a church and a, and a palace on the right, and, and these have these retables where the, where the deities stand, where the king and queen stands, and somehow they give you permission to, to exist in that public place, that somehow through, because of that place of vantage, place of power, that somehow there is that equation between where you are on the plaza and these people are up or high up in their, in their uh, you know, receptacles. And so we, we were concerned about how that expression of vantage became, or at least Moneo was concerned about it. And so his building then makes a facade, which is all of the tables. So each of us, you know, going to the city hall to pay our taxes or to pay our fines or, or to meet with the councillors, have access to these terraces. And then you become the deity and you give sanction to public space as a private individual in the city. And so a really subversive idea, but in elegant and graceful way, making an, a real statement on that plaza about power, about hegemony, and about who, uh, you know, who controls the city. So here we are standing in one of those balconies looking down. And so the idea of vantage was really important for us in the public building, but also the idea that it would be flexible, that you would have a society of rooms that was flexible to use. So here are some images of, uh, of the scheme uh, some drawings of the project. So the project has two characteristics on the front facade of the building. All of those different program elements are brought to bear in a very simple regulating system of concrete so that all of the different requirements of fenestration and enclosure are expressed through this, you know, organizing uh, condition of a facade. But when you're inside, you can see all of that ambiguity of circulation of scale uh, that it is a free free space that you have all kinds of access and, and cross communication. So here is the uh, the facade itself, the building fronting onto the street. Uh, Varnadhar was the uh, landscape architect on this project. Uh, this is a, another drawing by Surubi, which shows you that that same conversation between the rigor of that front facade and the and the looseness of the interior environment. Uh, so here's the front facade of that building, the interior environment, that brick wall, the wonderful gardens on the outside, and this deep veranda that, you know, is never air conditioned and used through the year. There's water on that south side of the building. And so all of the breezes coming in from the south catch that moisture, rise up through and get out through the louvers on the top. And so again, without air conditioning, a very comfortable building to use through the year. Um, so here's the section, north-south section, that gives you, you know, all of those levels and places uh, of vantage. Um, the interior of the uh, main auditorium, which is a, which is an inflected a plywood enclosure, which gives you, a, you know, acoustical performance even for spoken word events without uh, amplification. Uh, Didier Weiss was the uh, uh, the acoustical engineer. This is the upper floor looking back down from the uppermost level to the gardens below and then onto the roof. And there's Harshit, our project architect, who was responsible for this building, who studied in Tumkur and worked with us for four years uh, on this project, uh, spending a lot of time on site and coordinating everything for us uh, for this project. Here are some drawings by Divyang, which show you, uh, you know, the public life of the building. And it's back to being like this with all kinds of activities, book readings and storytelling sessions, performances and gatherings, uh, a rich internal volume for all kinds of public engagements. Um, we've had four Nobel laureates speak at that auditorium since February 2019. So it's a really important public institution. And that's the other thing that architects do the design, but then it needs stewardship afterwards that someone has to take it and run with it and Ravi and Raghu and all of them at BIC are really uh, amazing, amazing people who've converted it into a really throbbing part of the city. 
uh, and the last, there are no projects in this, so I'll be very quick. The idea of the historical sense that somehow through all of our RSPs and our travel sketches and, and looking at our history, that somehow that then informs the way we may find contemporary expression. Uh, and so to push you guys to get out there and travel and see as much as you can to draw all the time so that in your blood, you will then transfer the lessons of, of history. And all the great architects did it. This is Corbusier looking back at Palladio and making a plan that's almost identical to Palladio. But in recognizing the proportions and scale of Palladio, then Cobb is able to move away from Palladio, making a building that then is free of structural implications. It's a free plan and really creating the revolution that all of us are still part of. That there is a real distinct expression of a newness which comes from an understanding of the past. So that's, that's Palladio and Cobb in that great essay that Colin Rowe wrote about, uh, about this called the, uh, the Mathematics of the Ideal Villa. And so we too look back at our heroes at, uh, you know, at um, Alison Smithson or, you know, with the Matt Building or Herman Hertzberger with participatory space or Khan with form and design, Korea with deep structure or Utsun who talks about the beautiful idea, the, find, the finding of that particular expression for that particular location. And this is Sikandra, uh, that building that I was talking about, but through really simple architectural moves to find something of incredible value. Uh, and so just uh, a nod to all of my teachers, to Mr. Dubey who taught me here in Bangalore, to Fred and Julian who, were, who was my employer and my teacher at MIT, Graham Morrison who I worked with uh, you know, on two projects in India, wonderful architect from London, Eliza Morrison, and then the Glen Market teachers, Lindsay Britt, uh, Glenn, Richard, and Peter. And of course, Doshi, who uh, you know, is a guru for so many of us who I made two films with uh, and worked at his office, et cetera, and learned more about being a good person um, and not just about architecture, to, to, about humanity and about humility and all of the wonderful lessons that Doshi is a great uh, example of. Uh, we made two films on Doshi. Uh, Anaya, if you have the time, I have a five minute clip from the first film. Uh, if you're okay, I can play that and then end. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, yes, sir, definitely. Great. Okay, so here goes. sustainable building it should use everything which is available from almost west and all this is done by the local people it's all done i told them just do what you like i gave them pieces so they wanted this is amida bachchan for them Very small in entrance, not the royal entrance, no portico, nothing, a little courtyard. It's like a domestic entrance. And the entrance here is even like that, you know, it's very simple. I was thinking I not only have an office only for myself, but close that fine. Why can't it become a public space? So you're talking about public and private, form versus formlessness growth and other things and yet it has to be a studio and then you talk about partly above partly below ground all things happen my 
granddaughter. Let us see, my darling daughter. <laughs> I've made this building by chance, the extension. The building happened because I had to make this into non-agricultural land. And so I had to find something. Yeah. So the neighbor, neighbor had a, I only curved sheets. So I said, overnight, let me make the curved sheets and make a plan. So I made a plan and I made the roof and I got my stamp. But then I said, my God, how nice this is. So always there are clues. We must be aware to use them. insert into this, as if that this building is going in. It moves like this. And this is, you can see the whole sample. And it's north-south. And then I get a very big garden here. Again, this is against Vastu. This is west. And this is south. So when Vastu chap came here and he saw this, he says, are you going to have some trouble? I said, no. He said, you never had any problem. I said, no, in fact, I have been successful. After once he comes back and says, you are right. This is where Dhirubhai Ambani's entrance is. This is Vasco. I said, why don't they make a village? And that's what I like, a tree, a garden, the steps. And that's how it began to happen. Then one day he made those arches and then became everything. And again, it has all the waste products. It has China mosaic, which was never used before. It has Gaudi, it has Rai, everything is there. It is like a good food that you enjoy, which is done by the best chefs. But you are the one who is digesting this. And you have to convert that into your blood and your life. And what I do is only follow this biological order. Borrow everything and finally become yourself. And that Gandhiji's idea that, look, Open the windows, but see that your roof is not blown out. The foundations are pretty strong. So you have to be deep inside an Indian who is frugal, who can invent, who can take a chance, and who can starve. There is a student here from Stuttgart, you know, who is working there, and I was talking to her about Indianness, and she mentioned something very interesting. She says, you know, Indianness is in riding in the bus or in the train. In the train, there are no windows in some places. You are in a journey and the air is going on all the time everywhere and you are partly inside and partly outside. I think that is India. And not only but this way, physically, philosophically also. We are very ambiguous, more or less. I may come, I may not come. Thank you, sir. That was a very informative and amazing presentation. Unfortunately, Mishra, sir, was stuck in some work and couldn't join us. Uh, we are now open to questions. Hi, ma'am. Uh, Hi. Hi. We are now open to questions from our audience and people joining us from the Facebook live stream can just post their questions, then we will pick it up for you. I request everyone asking questions to please keep your cameras on. Um, Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. My name is Gauri Raut, and I really like the like your presentation and the structures which were made. The question which I want to ask that um, in your presentation, a lot of uh, uh, yeah, you included a lot of sketches. So um, yeah, so like uh, all your structures were initiated from the sketches, but nowadays the students are like more inclined towards softwares. Like even for the basic designing, the initial uh, stages of designing, we tend to use softwares. So how important is it for us young architects to learn the importance of hand sketching and how can we protect uh, ourselves from software taking over the traditional methods of sketching? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm uh, I'm very fond of sketching, but let let me step back a bit. So when when we travel and we look at buildings and you know we're we're trying to understand them, uh, most of us draw, you know, or, or you know, rather than I or at least 
I draw. And, and so when you draw, in fact, what happens is that you uh, internalize in terms of your muscle memory, certain conditions of, of, of the scale of things, of the proportion of things, of the quality of things. So somehow in, in drawing, you're capturing some essence of what the building is. And so when you come back to the office and you're, you're going to design something, if you use your hands, your hands sometimes are able to remember better than your brain. And so you bring to bear on the paper something that even you're surprised that you were doing because you know your hand remembers something. And so sometimes you're completely absent in your drawing and, and so that then brings to bear certain qualities. So I, I would suggest that if, if you are going out and if you're drawing and if you're seeing the world through that way, in that way, that then it's useful to use your hands because your hand remembers things that sometimes we don't remember. But there is another answer to the question as well, which is in the process of design, what is the importance of drawing? So let's say that you've come to some understanding of the gestalt of the plan and that you're trying to further the design. I think, you know, the younger kids are more adept at doing uh, stuff on computer. And so, you know, I would say that maybe we have our own way of working, but I mean, there are so many people who are doing such beautiful things without having drawn anything at all on the paper. So there are processes which we are, which we ourselves are not very good at, but there are very, very good youngsters who, you know, who are able to do things, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that are wonderful and sublime. And, and so I wouldn't say that there is a rule for us. I think it's useful. And, and, you know, I think when you draw things outside and come back to the office, it's nice to trust your hands a bit and, and to bring that to bear in the process. I also feel it's like, uh, depends on how gifted you are, right? Like, I think if uh, uh, some of us are very gifted at sketching, you should continue it. Like I can't sketch as well as the joy does. So I don't sketch, you know? So I think it depends on what you're good at and you should hone it and make it better. So there's no one medium of representation, you know? So I think it's like a mix of things, but if you are gifted, obviously you can try honing your sketching skills and drawing skills, but I think uh, some of you are like really gifted naturally, you should really make use of it a lot more. Thanks, Kauri. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Aditya Ward. Uh, and my question is like, uh, whenever we start designing, uh, the primary question is, should we design a structure such that it blends with the site context or it stand out from the site context, like how the site is. Uh, and there's always a debate uh, in between person, like whether should it blend or whether should it contrast with the surrounding. So like, what's your opinion? And like, if given a choice, uh, what would uh, your choice? Like, should it blend or should it contrast? Mm -hmm. I think Aditya, it depends on what you want to be. You want to be the great star architect, you stand out, you know? Mm -hmm or you want to live with the environment and blend your buildings into everything, but do it beautifully, then you should be in the context of your building. And that's how we believe uh, we should design. So uh, it's not about making this one bold statement, you know, there are projects where you may have to do it, but I think most of the times it's very critical that you kind of respect what is around you and kind of uh, uh, risk, uh, you, Respond, yeah. yeah, respond to that. You know, it's not like this is my site. I'll do whatever the hell I want. Okay. You can't do that. At least we don't do that. So it depends on what you want to say to the world. <laughs> yeah, but it also depends on the project. I mean, uh, like for yeah. instance, if I look at uh, historically, if I look at buildings like the Sydney Opera House, for instance, is a very very dramatic, yeah. iconic. I mean, maybe the first you know modern iconic building, so to speak. But even in that building, in the way that I presented it to you today, though it has that really uh, particular expression, it is also an expression of that location. So it is contextual and yet it makes a massive statement. So like uh, Robert Venturi said, you know, the answer is both and. So it has to be both contextual and spectacular. So, <laughs> so you can... You can take what you want from that. It depends on the project. Some projects you, you want to do a much more understated. Uh, and, and that's why, I mean, at the beginning of the project, you have to ask those questions like Khan used to ask, you know, what is this? What is the nature of this commission? You know, what, you know, how do I go about doing it? And so those discussions are important to have because you come to understand the project through those conversations. 
Thank you, Aditya. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, actually, taking ahead from Aditya's question a bit. So, but when we talk in terms of um, the cityscape, so if we talk in terms of Mumbai, um, the city with the suburbs and Mumbai, it is um, developed from the invasions that had happened. So from British, we have uh, Gothic structures, then even some uh, Parsi structures. Uh, but when we talk of Navi Mumbai, it was a very developed from on ground, like from the beginning itself. And uh, when we have to introduce new projects or newer elements, uh, how do we go about it? Like, you know, to have a blend in, to have how to match the cityscape entirely, how do we go about that? Yeah, no, so, um, I mean, a lot of our cities are like you describe, Anaya, they are kind of uh, no man's land, no? I mean, we don't have the classical medieval city where, like Moneo's site, you know, God, if only we had that kind of a site with so much uh, character and so many things to draw from. But most often when we get a project, we're in kind of this no man's land, there's nothing really of architectural quality. And so we're really floundering on how you respond. Um, I don't have an easy answer to that. I mean, one has to probably visit the site a, numer a number of times because there may be other cues that you respond to apart from architecture. Maybe there are, you know, a group of monkeys who come every day in the evening or, you know, there's, there's like a passageway that people cut across your site to get to another part of the city. I don't know, there may be clues that you don't otherwise, or, or maybe the wind is traveling a certain way that maybe, you know, you want to catch. So sometimes the responses may not be architectural, that your response to context may not be just simply uh, an architectural response. It may be actually accommodating other things, you know, that it may be accommodating, uh, you know, these kinds of patterns of movement or animals, or, you know, that there is uh, climatic conditions, et cetera. Uh, but it is, a, it is an, it's, a, it's an important question that you ask because we, unlike a lot of our European colleagues don't have the kind of fabric that one responds to through architecture that you're, you're really always almost working in, in kind of a non, you know, a places of not, not particular significant quality. Um, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough one. So it, it only means that you have to spend more time at site because then you get answers when you're there, I think. Yes, sir. thank you. Thanks, Anaya. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. So, um, landscape architects and architects, they should work hand in hand. But if landscape architects um, get a chance to present more dominating layouts, so that would help them create an aesthetic of its own, like for the structure alongside of nature. And there even is a saying that, um, Earth, it is not a canvas and nature, it is not a suitable material for art installation. So I just wanted to know what your views are regarding this. Um, yeah, not very clear about this question. Are you, are you asking if, uh, if landscape should come before architecture? Is that, is that your question? I in a way? wanted to ask if um landscape architects are given all the freedom to experiment right. what would be the potential of architecture i think so yeah so there's two ways right there are already sites with uh, major vegetation sometimes you know in some of your projects so um so kind of building your architecture around that respecting that that is one way of like the natural landscape but once the architecture is designed uh, in projects that we work with it's a very collaborative process it's not like one person does because i think the vision of the building has to also come through in the landscape you know so it's not like you finish the building and there's no project where you say do whatever you want you know there's something you want to highlight there's something that you want to uh, blend in with the architecture so it's like a very collaborative process and uh, you know all the projects that we do especially with the we, we do have a general idea of what you want but then the landscape architect uh, basically designs and uh, um, brings in the final product you know because that, that's not our expertise either so you need to trust each other to do that 
Um, if if I was to take a, a reference from the projects that we showed you today, uh, Sahil, uh, if if for instance in the school, um, the first is that, that the site is a sloping site, and so there is a there's certain cadence for the slope of that site, and so we were conscious of how we would build without having to cut a lot of stuff out and and dig up the site. But I think in that project, particularly working with Santosh, who was the landscape architect on that, the notion of where landscape appears and in what form the landscape appears is tied directly to what fronts onto it. You know, what kind of uses, who's filling out there? Is it a place of enclosure? Is it a place of prospect? Uh, is it a is it a kind of landscape which is supposed to separate things out? You know, like that green uh, tropical garden in the middle of the building that all of these decisions are made together with the landscape architect, that we're trying to figure out ways in which to make the landscape a form of enclosure or a form of prospect to give you access. So even in the BIC, BIC actually done by Varnadhar and there, in fact, there's also a performative quality for the landscape. So the back of the site actually has a nala, a, a, a stormwater drain running, which is quite polluted. And so her landscape, which runs along the edge of the site on the on the eastern side of the site, is a performative landscape. So it is, it's a palette of materials which is cleaning up the earth. It's a forest right now, on a site which actually didn't have any good soil at all. I mean, there was nothing growing on that site, and today it's like a forest. You know, the building sits within this forest that Varna has designed. Um, but there is a larger question that you are asking, which is, at what point does the landscape architect come to, to play, come to the game? You know, when when is he or she involved in the exercise? And and with BIC, I think the landscape architect came in a little late, but with with the school and with the retail building that I showed you, the landscape architect was on board right at the beginning of the project. And so, the retail building as well is all about how you navigate around those trees, how you accommodate water in the right place and how all of the rooms are connected to places of refuge, you know, that you can get out and there would be a certain condition. And this is all as a response to the site that existed there. So that conversation, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think it's important for both to be working together from the beginning. The land comes first. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. I wanted to ask, how uh, landscape and planning can reduce the consequences of increasing global warming and how can one approach the idea of sustainable development in today's world? A very general question. Mm -hmm. um, how does landscape, so I, I don't know, I mean, there are very textbook answers to your question. You can use uh, native species of plants because native species conserve more water, they're more hardy, they're more robust and resilient. Uh, you try to use, uh, uh, you know, less, uh, you know, you try to use what is existing, which means that you save the topsoil before you start constructing. And then you use the same topsoil to fill back, you know, once you finish the project so that you're not, uh, you know, depleting the topsoil content on the site when you're starting to excavate for foundations. Um, you try to keep all of the planting that exists there, try not to transplant. I mean, these are all, they're all in any textbook. You probably know the answers already that, that I'm giving you, Sakshi. Um, but with regards to the larger question about sustainability, uh, I mean, I, we don't have many of those answers, particularly to do with the kind of materials one uses for construction. So if you've seen our project, for instance, the steel building is steel because it is something that will be dismantled and taken away later for whatever other whatever other site that the site that the client gets, it'll go and, and live there for some time. So that's the idea for the steel building. But steel steel in and of itself is quite a terrible material to use because it's you know got a huge embodied energy content. It takes a lot of heat to produce, it's excavated out of the earth, etc. But I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what else we could have used that's robust and hardy and will last and will be able to be used again and again. So the question of the materiality of the building with reference to sustainability has to be seen in the larger context of things. It's larger lifespan, it's longevity, uh, you know, and, and its application. Is it something that you need to be uh, worried about for, uh, you know, in terms of it being used again, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't have a simple answer to that. Of course, we do all of the other things with regards to sustainability. BIC, for instance, 
uh, is in the in the process for getting a Griha five star rating, which means that it doesn't use much air conditioning, and when it does, it's it's uh, super, you know, uh, uh, low intensity air conditioning. It's mostly naturally ventilated. We used a lot of natural materials. Uh, it's got solar power that supports all of its lighting. I mean, everybody does this now, so it isn't really worth talking about. I mean, this idea of sustainability is kind of uh, everybody follows those norms. Uh, but there are questions about the materials one uses, and that 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 question has to be tied back to this notion of meaning. To the notion of its longevity and its application so the, the, it's not a simple checklist where you say i'll never use steel or i'll never use concrete i think it has to be weighted against all of the other things one is trying to achieve through architecture as an expression of culture sorry if it's a really roundabout answer to your question Sakshi. so thank you sir. thank you i wanted to ask that Nowadays, uh, the most structures that are built in the urban area are made from steel and glass. But when we use some kind of unique material, how is it able? How is that structure able to like uh, blend in with the surrounding and become a part of the city? If you use, can you repeat it again? Uh, nowadays, when uh, nowadays the most structures that we see are made out of steel and glass. But when we use some traditional material, how is it able to blend with surrounding cities? How does a traditional a building built with traditional materials blend in with a city that's made out of steel and glass? Is that your question? Yes, sir. Um, uh, I mean, so I, are you interested in using uh, traditional materials? Is that why you're asking and, and you're struggling to figure out a way to make that conversation? Is that is that the question? Um, but traditional is like, you know, there are so many buildings which are made with brick and clad with stone. And I think you have to stay true to your time. You don't have to obviously imitate what is old. But representation of materials, you can bring in a lot of traditional materials into the architecture that you do. You know, all modern structures are not in steel and glass. So I think it's about putting together that palette of materials that you believe in and that work for the building that you're designing uh, for its climate and for its place and all that, you know. So I don't, uh, you don't have to blend in with what is there because it may not be the right thing for that time and that purpose of the building. But more in terms of maybe the scale and uh, what it uh, looks on to and stuff like that, you'll have to respond, but you don't have to imitate again. I have, I have an example for you, which is the inverse of what you're asking, <laughs> which is that uh, in, uh, you know, Foster did a beautiful, I'm trying to remember the name, um, but he did a beautiful museum, which is right up against uh, an old Roman ruin. So there's a Roman ruin, which is made all out of stone. Um, and it's, it's like a miniature version of the Parthenon. So it's a linear sort of building colonnade on the outside with a pediment, etc. cetera. So it's the ruin of the old building. And right up against it, Foster made a new museum completely out of steel and glass. So it's, it's the inverse of what you're asking. But you should see the way in which he handles the scale of the new building with reference to the old building. So I think the uh, materiality is one question, but I think in terms of scale and proportion, there are many other ways in which one responds to context. That you're, you're also responding in terms of how people move, you're also responding in terms of enclosure, in terms of the street edge. That material is one of many things that you use to respond, and it isn't the only way that you express uh, you know, your solidarity with context. So I'll, I'll try and send to Anaya later, maybe once I remember, I'll send her the, the link and you should take a look at that project. It's quite an amazing uh, exercise in contextual project with, with no similar materials at all. You know, someone who's just doing a completely different thing, but being very sensitive to the conditions around uh, him. So I'll, I'll send to Anaya when, when, when I can after. Thank you, Anush. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. 
Uh, I actually, I, I loved all the projects that you presented today. And I had a question regarding the school, uh, the first project that you had presented of the school. And you talked about the spaces in between and how they would lead to chance encounters in these spaces. And <clears throat> so I would also like to talk about, so currently we have a design assignment of kind of creating this campus for an institution or a college campus, so to say. And I was just wondering how we create this kind of like the sense of community you were talking about. And our site is kind of like a larger uh, to a larger mm. kind of a site. And I was wondering how we can form these spaces in between where we have a lot of room to kind of spread around the structures in, but still, you know, wanting to have that sense of the spaces in between. So if you could, I don't know, give us a little hint for it. Well, uh, yeah, at a campus scale, that is, uh, it is a, it is a challenge. Uh, I wish we had some more time, but in Nalanda University, in that campus plan, in fact, there are there are these three principles that uh, you know we tried to follow when we were laying out the campus plan for the Nalanda campus. The first was the fact that we would have very simple buildings, but we would have very complex open spaces, so that the way that the organize the buildings were organized, the buildings themselves were just rectilinear blocks, you know, squares or rectangles. But then in the way that they were organized on site, we were very, very conscious of the scale of the open space between them. So there was a hierarchy of that open space. So there were smaller spaces where smaller groups would congregate, but there were main spaces where you would actually have the main spine of the campus, et cetera. It is an exercise in scale. I, I, you, you'd have to, I don't know, model it in SketchUp or do a physical model to understand what the texture of the fabric is, You know how, how you're going to make that, that variation in, in any of the medieval cities, you see that, you know, that this variation in scale is such a rich sequence. So that was the first principle. The second principle was that the campus had to be mixed use, which unfortunately the Nalanda University campus that's being built now isn't. And our central premise for our competition project was that if I had housing and the classrooms and everything together in the same place, that the campus was always alive. What happens nowadays in most campuses is that the housing is somewhere else, the classrooms are somewhere else. And so in the evenings, there's nobody in the central part of the campus, everybody's in the, in the housing. And so we wanted to make something that approximates the condition of the city, that it was like a city, it was mixed use, everybody was everywhere and you always have a lively environment. And so that's an important part of how you organize program. And the third, which was particularly particular to the site, is that there were two distinct conditions on that side. On the one hand, you had the highway, and so it was closed off, and there were small settlements of farms and things that, like that. And on the south side were the hills. There was the Raj, Rajgir Hills, which, which run from Nalanda down south to Rajgir. And so the site had these, this one part, which was more like a, a refuge. So up against the highway, the character of the open space clusters of the buildings was very, very distinct. They were smaller, they were more sequestered and protected from the highway. Whereas as you came down to the south of the, of the site, away from the road and towards the big view, that the building started opening up in terms of how these open spaces would receive the big view, would receive all of the rainwater that was coming off the hills, hold the water in tanks, et cetera. That, that was a particular condition of that site that then gave us again another lesson in how to handle open space between. Uh, again, I'll, I'll maybe extract it from the presentation and send the Nalanda stuff out to Anaya so that you can see it as well. But I think we were very, very disappointed to lose that competition. It would have been an amazing place. <laughs> but, yes, it but it's Doshi, so it's fine. <laughs> you know? yeah. Thank you so much. So that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I guess we don't have any more questions, so we can end our today's manan here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We hope once uh, college begins offline, we can again invite you both and we will get a chance to meet you as well as visit some of your projects. Uh, yes. Any concluding notes from your side? Um, all of you are welcome to visit us when you come to Bangalore. Please come. We are looking for JJ uh, <laughs> architects in our office. So do apply and, uh, and hope hope to see you in Bangalore at some point. Yeah, but, and please like tell you. Professor Mishra that we missed him. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yes, sir. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Sure. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.